All right, it's right. We are on. So I, I give the floor to you, Ken. Thanks. Um, and welcome to the third panel of MASA's 22nd symposium coming to you live via various points in Australia, Malaysia, and Singapore right now. As you all know, we've had um, a rather historic um, couple of years with Malaysia since the 2018 elections. Um, Malaysia's reawakening this year after last year's torrid politics and the tragedy of pandemic mismanagement has been a struggle to sustain mass vaccinations and healthcare systems this year amid uh, another prime minister and acute claims for better Malay Muslim politics. As Malaysia's fractures over race, religion, and its regions now widen and uh, pandemic you know, fatigue threatens the ailing economy with no obvious respect, can Malaysia actually bounce back um, with fresh elections expected next year? And um, what exactly is going on in Malaysia, I suppose is the question that many people continue to ask. Today's discussion, we hope to have um, active participation with all of you watching. Uh, please post your questions um, via the Facebook page uh, where this is streaming. And um, I think there might be also other ways to post these question, uh, questions, but I'm not sure about that. Um, today, we're gonna have uh, a few people who of course are the specialist experts in this area who um, hopefully will give us some insights, um, starting with um, Dr. Bridget Welsh from uh, Nottingham University, Malaysia. Uh, welcome back, Bridget. I understand you've been abroad, which is amazing that you're back in time just for this. Um, there's uh, Associate Professor Masna Mohammed at the National University of Singapore. Welcome, Masna. Good to have you. And uh, Professor James Chin, University of Tasmania, who is of course also the gracious host of this year's uh, MASA Symposium. Thanks James for uh, organizing all of this to happen. Um, to start with, I thought maybe we could um, go with uh, what James might outline are the problems or the challenges that uh, Malaysia is now facing as it heads towards uh, at least two sets of state elections, Malacca and Sarawak, and possibly a federal one in the near horizon. After that, we might throw to Bridget, and then uh, Masna will show us and walk us through a collection of uh, slides, which I'm sure will spark off even more discussion. James, would you like to start? Well, thank you very much, Tim. Um, and thank you very much for joining us on FB Live. So I think I'll start off by talking about this new administration under Ismail Sabri. Uh, as many of your viewers know, uh, is, is they haven't even celebrated their 100 days in power. So basically, the way to understand this new government is that uh, there's almost a no change in government. If you look at the cabinet appointments, it was basically no change. Uh, some ministers changed their portfolio, but other than that, uh, almost all the previous uh, people in the last meeting administration made it back in the Ismail Sabri government. Uh, but there are some significant uh, things that is happening in the background, which I thought that I should uh, provide a very brief summary. Uh, the first one is that Ismail Sabri is very different in terms of the style of government that he's leading compared to Muyadin Yassin. And I'll just outline the first one. The first one is obviously that unlike Muyadin Yassin, he's quite willing to come to a deal with what in Malaysia they call the court cluster Master Makama. Uh, this is a group of senior AMNO leaders who were basically charged for corruption, a money laundry and maladministration. And Pakatan Harapan came to power in 2018. Uh, the biggest fish of this group, of course, is, is Najib Razak, followed by Azai Hamidi, the current incumbent AMNO president. So it is quite clear that during um, Yerin Yassin's time, one of the reasons why uh, Najib and Zahid and the biggest faction AMNO was against Muyadin Yassin was because he was not willing really to deal with this group. But it's very clear to me now, uh, after a you know, few months of the uh, Ismail Sabri government, that uh, it is quite clear that uh, Najib and Zahid has come to terms of understanding with Ismail Sabri. Uh, whether Ismail Sabri will intervene to help Najib and, and Zahid 
it is still not quite clear because the appeal is still ongoing. Uh, the court case is still ongoing. But it is quite clear that uh, uh, Zahid and Najib have stopped all their threats against the government. Uh, if you remember during uh, Muyadin's short term in government, they were constantly under attack by the Zahid and, and Najib faction. Uh, second thing that is, is, is obviously very different from the Muyadin administration is that Ismail Sabri is all about survival politics. So that's the reason why he was quite willing to sign some sort of an MOU uh, with the opposition. Uh, but what is clear about the MOU is that it's really not worth the paper it's printed on. It's all about helping the government to survive helping the government to pass the budget, the budget hasn't been passed yet. And it's all about some sort of political truce uh, between now and GE15. Uh, it is my contention that GE15 will actually be held next year, that this government will not wait until 2023. And I'll explain the reasons why in, in a little while. Uh, but coming back to this government, uh, one commonality is that the challenges facing the Ismail Sabri government is very similar what Muyadin was facing before he fell, and that is uh, how to reopen up the economy. Uh, I think most people do not realize how serious uh, the Malaysian economy is, 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 is facing. Uh, a lot of the MSC, MSC, uh, SMEs in, in, in Malaysia I've been told, are not actually operating at 100% status. Uh, a lot of the factories are actually not opening up. Uh, I don't believe the stories you hear that the Malaysian economy is recovering. The economy is really not recovering and it's in big trouble. Secondly, is that they're having problems reopening up the country uh, in terms of dealing with the COVID-19. Uh, Delta Plus, which is a very variant strain of Delta, is already in Malaysia. Uh, they already had one big super spreader event, and that was the Sabah election last year. And they're heading towards another two super spreader event. One, of course, is the upcoming uh, Malacca election. And after that, shortly after that, the same group of people rushing to Malacca will be carrying the virus and rushing off to Sarawak, where the elections will probably be held in December. So basically, my contention is that this is very much an unknown plus government, even though Ismail Sabri doesn't want to say anything because he doesn't want to offend the Satu. It's basically hanging in there. It's all about political survival at the GE15. And the GE15, it is my contention that it is all about uh, I'm not fighting the Satu. And that, Basically, uh, what they're looking for is a clear answer from the voters about who is the dominant uh, Malay party in Malaysian politics. Uh, right now, it is not very clear who is the dominant party uh, because Amno says it's dominant, but Satu says it's also dominant. But basically, there's only uh, one space or one tiger allowed in the, in the governing coalition. So Amno and Bersatu have to slough it out. The interesting role that is being played right now is, of course, past. PAS has uh, quite interestingly moved itself right in the middle, uh, trying to appease both sides, trying to hang on and try to make sure this government survives. Uh, the reason is that PAS has been out of power for such a long time. Uh, since they got back into power, uh, they realized that there are lots of perks involved, there are lots of things they can do in terms of Islamization policy. So they're desperate to keep the government intact. Uh, but I suspect uh, they've burned their bridge with Amno. If you look at some of the statements coming out in the last few days, and we will know the status of the past Amno uh, relationship and the past Pesatu relationship when the results of the Malacca uh, state election comes out. Uh, it is quite clear that uh, all the major uh, parties are looking towards the Malacca results as some sort of a signal for the wider uh, G15. Uh, in terms of the other unknowns, I think it is also uh, unknown whether Mahathe will be making a big comeback with the Juan. As you know, uh, one of the interesting things about Mahathe is that uh, he has been behind uh, you know, uh, the, the three ma major Malay parties uh, in the last uh, uh, 30 years of Malaysian politics. People don't realize that the UMNO we see today is actually UMNO Baru, and that was set up by Mahathe before he changed the name back to UMNO. Uh, he was basically behind the founding of PBBM Bersatu, and now he's, he's trying his luck with the Malay based party, which is Pejuan. Uh, the interesting question is that whether Mahathe will lead Pejuan in the next uh, general election. Uh, the other unknown, of course, is that the Undi 18 thing. We, we don't know what is the, uh, we don't know how the young people, the 18, 19, 20 years old, how they're going to vote. And it's quite interesting that uh, the mainstream political establishment uh, is showing signs of fear. So, for example, in Surawa, one of the reasons uh, GPS has decided to rush uh, for this state election 
despite the fact that there's a, a big COVID problem in Sarawak, is that they do not want to face the, the, the young voters. And of course, the biggest unknown has, has always been in Malaysian politics for the last 10 years is that uh, what is the status of Anwar Ibrahim? Will he be given another chance to leave Qatar Harapan into the next general election? Or will he forever be prime minister in waiting? Thank you very much. Sorry, the great uh, mute and unmute dance. Thanks, James, for that. Um, I, I think um, some of those salient points you raised and the underlying um, theme we seem to be circling around quite a bit in the last several months, which uh, Bridget has written quite incisively about, as well as her most recent comment I noted, noticed about the whole Undi 18 youth vote uh, denial um, with these state elections but also what it actually uh, means for our general unstable polity. Um, th this uh, rationale for Lanka Sheraton as well, um, which is supposed to what, uh, bring back Malay Muslim unity and hegemony, it hadn't seemed to worked out very well. I, I was just curious, Bridget, um, some of those points, uh, certainly the ones you've also written about recently, um, whether you could, um, enlarge or extrapolate from what James was saying too? Hello. <laughs> uh, Hi. Hi. Yes, welcome to Malaysia where internet is unstable. <laughs> Apologies. I will continue to try to speak, but if uh, if I, if there is a problem, uh, uh, please forgive me. I'd like to sort of take up what you've just said, Keen, uh, and sort of talk about two bigger issues uh, uh, that I see are useful for us to understand these kind of transformations that are happening. And I want to take the kind of discussion a little bit higher in terms of the broader shifts uh, of what I see happening. Uh, I, let's first to talk about the drivers in contemporary Malaysian politics, and then what we're seeing of which uh, Undi 18 and the different dynamics and pressures from the young are going to be part a critical component. So generally, number one is we see weak leadership and weak political parties. We have a decay of UMNO, uh, and UMNO is not managing its, its decay very well. Uh, uh, decline and issues involving that uh, are not unknown in, in other parts of the world, and parties do be able to, re to regroup. We're seeing whether or not in these elections, especially in Malacca, if it's able to kind of regroup. It's very challenging when it has too big divisions over how it should position itself politically. And of course, it has weak leadership. And that le weak leadership uh, wants to come back and take it back and save it. The irony of this is that Najib Tun Razak is the one who put uh, into to UMNO out of government. And it's and of course, he's the key contender to try to, um, to build it up again uh, in that context. The second broader shift that we're seeing is the kind of the impact of democratization in Malaysia over the last decade. Arguably, since 2008, we've seen a, uh, a situation where uh, the, um, <clears throat> the, the political space has opened, and that has meant that there has been a rise of new narratives, a rise of new interests, uh, a much more pressure on political parties, which have contributed to the weakening of the parties themselves, who have, have really not been able to, to address the gap uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of the demands of the electorate. And I think, uh, you know, people don't fully appreciate that of how much in Malaysia has changed in terms of the discussions of political space. Uh, both in a positive and negative ways. Bridget? Yes. Just, you said we haven't appreciated how much Malaysia has changed. And then for some reason you froze after that. Sorry about that, Keen. I was saying that uh, the democratization process has really opened up uh, in Malaysia in terms of political space, as well as political discourse. Uh, and this has been very impactful in terms of, uh, of raising different sets of issues and, uh, and changing, the changing the types of issues that are being discussed and the types of mobilization. I think you know, if we think about what's happening in Malaysia, uh, it has become much more open, uh, even though there are continued to be threats uh, in terms of democratization. 
The third major shift has been changing demographics. And we talk about this in terms of a youth electorate and a changing dynamics among the young. This is going to be a, a powerful force. The next GE, uh, GE15 will be transformative. Uh, one third of the electorate, uh, maybe even more than that, will be a new voters uh, that, or potential new voters. And this is going to mean that the, there, the gap between the, the, the weakened parties and the, the new and more sophisticated and a young electorate is going to be much more difficult for the parties to actually address. But we're also seeing shifts in terms of ethnic dynamics, as well as a kind of increasing sophistication of voters, much more informed because we have seen new sources of information in Malaysia, as there has been a much more broadening of social media space. And finally, of course, as, as James has implied, the economy has also had big major changes. Uh, and one of these things that's happening is that we have rising inequality, persistent inequality, a contracting social mobility, inadequate reform of the economy, and Malaysia's comparative advantage globally and regionally has declined. And so these have put pressures uh, uh, at broader drivers of their shifting this, the political landscape. And then what does this mean? And I think here are the things that I see happening uh, from on the ground and others. Number one, we see have a delegitimation of all political leaders. Uh, there's growing cynicism about political parties, about their ability to address um, issues to rate to the, you know, the traditional pattern of feudal loyalties has really ero eroding and, and particularly including in the Malay community. We're seeing all the political parties be the same as in their focus on power and patronage. Interests are driven by that, whether or not it's a decision by to appoint uh, a kind of Umno Stalworth, Idris Harun and Malacca, or whether or not it is uh, you know, the, the dynamics of making compromises among political parties, uh, be it the MOU and others. They, they talk about it being for the people, but it's really about the interests of the political parties and the elites. And the political elite as a, as a group has become, it, it has become very much um, uh, uh, clear in the eyes of many of the uh, of the electorate, but also something that I think is, is shifted in terms of how they view leadership. And this is something that is going to be very challenging uh, because we don't see new leaders that are actually offering different um, you know, ways of ways of conceptualizing and thinking about politics in a different way. Uh, we see the persistence of polarization, uh, and this is, of course, in along race, religion, reform, and region. Uh, but what is very worrying is how it is deepening with East in, in Borneo, in both Sabah and Sarawak, and the impact of that, I think, will be quite profound if it's not adequately addressed and it's not being addressed. Um, and we also see, interestingly enough, as the Malay uh, uh, agenda has been reignited, re re what's the most interesting to me is not that it's come back in the in the way that it has, but the blowback of society to that and the discussions of that, which really shows the vibrancy of what is happening. Uh, we see ideological shifts. Uh, the interesting is the rise of the political left in Malaysia as a major force, as a trigger from the issues of COVID. And we see, in, importantly, a major expansion of civil society as a result of democratization forces in new areas like the environment, philanthropy, and, and much more robust discussions of policy. Uh, and this is a fascinating dynamic because it makes for the complexities of what is happening. And ultimately, we see the impact of the COVID crisis. And this is where it goes back to the issues of the economy and inadequate economic reform and inadequate social safety nets. The COVID-19 is going to be around for some time. And what I think is going to be most interesting to watch in Malacca, to a less extent in Sarawak, because they feel is less uneven, the opposition is weaker, is how COVID plays out and starts to play out in the election. And the longer the new government... Uh, or uh, Ismail Sabri's not so quite new government, but not yet 100 days, uh, holds off for an election for next year, the more likely that the impact of COVID will continue to affect the political landscape. I'll turn. Thanks, Bridget. I think you said you will turn it over to Masna. I turn it over to you first to introduce my <laughs> Sorry, because you, you froze again. So I'm trying to complete your sentence. Sorry I'm sorry. I hope it wasn't too bad with the freezing. No, no, no. It was good. Uh, you know, to the point, and you obviously spoke to the technology. So it was very good. Um, to Mazna now, uh, and I think uh, she will walk us through um, what appear to be very compelling um, slides uh, and um, a narrative, which I'm sure we will like to hear more from uh, Mazna. 
thank you, uh, Kin. Yeah. Um, okay, I will. Let me share the screen first. Okay, I think um, that's okay with everyone. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Keen, and thank you, James and Bridget. I think you provided such a rich uh, background <laughs> to what I will attempt to say. Uh, so, so I'm, I, you know, I thought I would just uh, have this as a title, uh, although I think uh, most people are already kind of decided, you know, is uh, Malaysian politics sliding backwards or moving uh, forward kind of thing. So I, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I don't have like, I, I'm not as good as you and both of you, you know, with the details yeah, uh, and the intricacies of the politics. So what I'm trying to do is really to try to provide some kind of approach in understanding all these cacophonies of events. Uh, I'm also very lost, you know, most of the times. Um, with, with the, the dynamics, the personal and in, internal dynamics. So I will, I will just attempt uh, to just uh, provide uh, my kind of framework if I were to understand uh, Malaysian uh, politics uh, today. So I will start with this uh, very major kind of uh, events. I think that's kind of, uh, you know, in everyone's mind. So I, I put this, this uh, in bracket, you see, whether these three events are connected or discrete, uh, of course, we know, you know, Sheraton move uh, looms large and, and then in between there's electoral politics. And of course, the, the big elephant in the room is also the COVID uh, pandemic. So sometimes I think uh, people tend to kind of, uh, and I think all of us, I think, you know, think, tend to think of these three events as uh, very connected. Yes and no, I, I would say, uh, because Sheraton move uh, could be a barometer, you see, of who's in power. Uh, not even a barometer, but it is it is the manifestation of who came into power. But you know, it's not necessarily uh, the outcome of something that you see in an electoral politics. So everyone knows that. So electoral politics and Sheraton move. Um, yes, uh, the outcomes uh, were you see uh, the manifestation of power. However, I think these two events need to be separated. Um, it, it, it is uh, uh, something unprecedented, what, what happened in, in, in Sheraton Move. But electoral politics, I think, yes, we've been through it. See, we've been through it decades uh, and so on. Uh, and then there's COVID pandemic, which uh, had sort of complicated uh, everything. So this is where we see you know, the kind of uh, events is it, that, that uh, came about, you see, out of those three events. But to me, I, I would still like to see these three events as uh, discrete. Uh, it so happened, uh, the timing is that all, all, ha all happened to be at the same time. And I think it's quite important to kind of uh, uh, think of this event as discrete because it really doesn't actually show uh, what people are really thinking uh, at the ground level because we have no way, we don't have a proper election. Yes, and the COVID pandemic has of course uh, upended everything economically, socially, even uh, culturally. So uh, these are the things that I think that's new, uh, I suppose. Okay, the other um, thing that it has enveloped uh, most uh, people when they look at Malaysian politics is, is gloominess and darkness. So these are some of the metaphors and idioms. I think you'll recognize them, you know, paradise lost, uh, dark forces, justice in the wilderness, uh, what's in the name. Uh, well, no prizes for guessing what these are. These are actually titles of books that just, that just came out, right, during the last uh, few months. Um, what's in the name is the latest, uh, written by Nazir Raza. I haven't, I haven't uh, looked at it, but I think the idiom is meant. I, I think you know, it's meant to say what's in the name. Yes, you have a Raza name there. What, what's in the name? You know, a rose uh, by any by any other name uh, will smell sweetly, or just the opposite. Um, yeah. So I, I thought that you know, this sort of sense of gloominess needs a kind of a balance. Uh, uh, you might think that I'm just doing it for an academic exercise, but I think more than that, I think we need to see something behind all this gloominess and, and darkness. Uh, however, you see, sometimes the gloominess is also kind of reinforced by academic studies and concept. So these uh, concept authoritarian innovations, uh, it came out in, a, I think, a special issue of the journal Democratization. So Kurato and Fossati sort of uh, use this term and, and uh, Sebastian Detman was writing about the Malaysian case uh, to show that authoritarianism is around and it has uh, creatively morphed uh, to make itself uh, stronger. 
So things like, uh, you know, strengthening the unaccountable exercises of power. These are, these are the things that they use is to describe what is meant by uh, authoritarianism being innovated. Um, you have the diminishing spaces of public participation. And in, in the Malaysian case, uh, the use of polarizing discourse, I think that happened very strongly before the Sheraton move and actually uh, probably, you know, culminated and uh yeah you know uh, uh, ended in the Sheraton move because uh those days of course amno uh, passed they went to opposition so they were really using the um ethnic discourse uh, uh, starting with the protests against ICERT and then of course they see all that uh noise they see about DAP uh diminishing uh, Malay power and they had that big uh, gathering of all the Malay uh, parties so yeah, so, uh, you know, under this uh, kind of concept, you know, authoritarian innovation, this would be, this would uh, fall into it, that these actually uh, then, you know, provide legitimacy for the Sheraton move, or at least people were made to believe that uh, uh, there was justification, see, for Amno and PAS uh, coming back. Yeah? Nevertheless, I, I think that uh, we should also be aware of uh, some other things. See, it's like, like the glass is half full or half empty. So I want to bring up this study by uh, Kai Oswald and uh, Stephen Oliver. It's also published in the journal uh, Democratization. And I thought that this concept uh, is very uh, interesting uh, in understanding the political uh, or electoral landscape of Malaysia. So basically Oswald and Oliver kind of identified, you see this four, what they call the electoral uh, arenas. Um, basically saying that, uh, you know, each of these four electoral arenas would probably uh, result, you see, in something different. And, and it's not kind of replicated, you see, in all the other uh, arenas. Uh, of course, you can criticize and say, you know, it's not as simple as that. Uh, it's not as uh, monolithic, you know, but still I thought it was quite interesting because they have identified, say, for, the, for example, the Northeast uh, region, Kelantan and Trengganu, uh, we all know, popularly that it's a uh, past dominated and and you know is uh, 90 percent uh, malay voters and the result would be predicted you see along that line and for east malaysia i don't agree that they kind of put uh sabah and Sarawak together but nevertheless you know they've identified east malaysia see it's another electoral arena and then you have the peninsula uh, diverse uh what we call you know normally mixed seats where there are more than 50 percent non-malays and then the peninsula uh, malay uh, seats with more than 50% uh, Malay electorates or Malay uh, population. So if you, you were to sort of analyze the election uh, result, um, you would, of course, uh, see okay, the differences uh, in, in, as to the outcome. And of course, it, also, this, uh, it is also a deciding factor in how political parties uh, strategize right, their moves uh, in election. So of course, uh, we all know the usual story uh, in the Northeast and the Peninsula Malay uh, electorates, uh, you will have the Malay parties eh, contesting. And then you have a uh, Peninsula Diverse, that is where the PH probably um, uh, resulted is it, in their uh, victory. Is it, in, basically, they're very much dependent on the Peninsula uh, Diverse uh, seats. Now, I think this is quite important uh, because um, given the diversity okay, of our uh, electorates, it's, it will become uh, more and more uh, difficult to predict the outcome. And uh, UMNO, right, uh, used to be the dominant party. Now, it is really, given, given this situation, uh, how would uh, UMNO or Bersatu and PAS is it, uh, now uh, compete? Don't forget, they don't have their partners anymore. They don't have the BN. Uh, it used to be very hegemonic as far as the BN, uh, uh, as far as that, that situation uh, was concerned, where the BN and its partners were actually able to um, spread themselves out, you see, uh, among these four electoral arenas. But I think that's going to be a lot more difficult uh, now, uh, particularly, you know, like the East Malaysian situation where I think there's more assertion, see, on the uh, part of the locals, yeah, as to what they want to see to be the outcome of the election. And the, yeah, the peninsula diverse um, seats are also, I think, quite important because you ha also have Malays there. I mean, of course, these this are mixed seats, but this is where the urban Malays, you see, uh, would be situated. And they might not think the same way 
okay, as a previous uh, generation okay, of Malay uh, voters. And uh, even Kelantan and Terengganu, yes, you might think that uh, it's a safe uh, space for PAS or AMNO, but uh, we don't really know see, what will happen in, in the future. Okay, so um, I, this is sort of my uh, concept. Uh, this is the opposite of uh, authorita authoritarian innovation. So I'm just going to kind of throw out this concept for people to uh, debate or criticize, or, or it doesn't matter, you know, as long as you have some concept is it to deal with. So, of course, the end of the end. Now, that's a fact. And it's a very important and a very um, major, I think, factor that has happened, you see, post-2018. Uh, well, basically, Sheraton move actually uh, ended in the BN, you see. The, the 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 end of BN. I don't I don't see it. I don't know whether it's possible see, for the BN to be uh, recreated. Uh, well, I'm not sure. I mean, I leave you. I leave it to James and you know Bridget to to uh, probably talk about it. But as far as I'm concerned, it's very difficult for the BN parties is it, to come together. It's very difficult for Amno as a leader to uh, marshal see all the different parties back together into the BN. The other fact is that yes. There's a withering of AMNO dominance. And I think, uh, Bridget, you used, uh, you used the phrase decay of AMNO, very much so, I think. Yeah, you have Ismail Sabri there uh, controlling uh, the government, but you could see that he has made quite a lot of compromises. So it isn't that AMNO is strong anymore, see? And without the kind of uh, concessions that he's given to every side and all sides, yeah? So it, it basically it shows that uh, he's not all that strong. Yes, uh, as James has said, you know, he's very concerned about surviving. And the fact that you're concerned about surviving means, you see, that your position is not really secure. So there's the withering of um, no dominance. Yeah, and, and this, uh, the last two, the pro proliferation of autonomous non-state actors. So we, we, we don't seem to uh, acknowledge, you see, the existence, but I think, there's a lot more of non-state actors uh, today. Now, the reason why it's so difficult to study them is because there's so many groups. There's so many small groups, study groups, leading groups, you see, uh, charity groups, uh, food aid groups. I think if you look at them together, I think I, they can be a force. It's, it's a very decentered, you know, politics uh, today. But certainly, they're more autonomous. They're not uh, bound to any political parties. They're not bound to any uh, ideologies that we are used to. So that needs to be acknowledged. And, and finally, uh, the site of mobilization, I think is very, very diverse now. Multi-sited mobilization. Uh, I suppose that explains why it's so difficult to predict uh, what will be the outcome of the Malacca, uh, by, uh, uh, Malacca state election. Because even, you know, Utusan Malaysia yesterday, I just was looking at some of the news uh, uh, reportage yesterday. They were even saying, you know, uh, there will be no single party that will be able to go uh, cobble see, a strong uh, coalition. So it's very interesting coming from uh, Utusan uh, Malaysia. So I think uh, it's, it's uh, for me, you see, if you are able to see the other side of the picture, um, it gives us a little a wider room uh, to be able to explain okay, some of the many things uh, that's happening uh, today. So I, I will just uh, stop at that and uh, yeah, I just uh, open the floor, I suppose, uh, Kim. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Masna. That was a great um, survey of all these um, points that I guess um, were also touched on and raised by Bridget and James before that um, about basically the uh, glib phrase we always say, it's all terribly uh, transitory and um, uncertain and in turmoil right now. And what, of course, is behind all of that. And it's a good uh, reminder as well that um, we don't have quite the type of so-called monolithic politics that we used to have, or people might nostalgically refer to, uh, as I see rec as recently as um, overnight on social media, various people uh, paying homage to Dr. Mahate, young people, and in a way being nostalgic for a time when I don't think they were even born, which is um, might be quite indicative of where our politics are at. I, I was just curious to go a bit further into this to start some of the discussions. I see that uh, we have some questions now coming in, which we can uh, tackle one by one. Um, to go with uh, what, 
um, I think Bridget had um, raised already, where she, uh, Bridget, you, you talk about, in some ways, quite a uh, optimistic picture of sorts, really, about the sort of democratization that is going on uh, in this sort of fractured polity that we have. And Masna also, you know, talks about this, uh, raises in, you call it what, democratic innovations, uh, where we have these multi-sites, uh, multi-sited sort of um, activism. And uh, uh, is there some sort of renewed engagement with better policy development or policy development that also reflects maybe a less legitimate uh, political leadership? Are you speaking to me or to Mazda? <laughs> Uh, was, uh, to, Bridget, to both yeah. of you, I yeah, mean, yeah. I think I, that, that was the thread I thought linked both of you um, to what you were saying. So I'll start and I, I, that I would say that, um, uh, you know, when I speak about the rise of civil society, I, I'm speaking about the same thing that, that, that Mazda is pointing to in a different way of multiple centers of non-state actors that have emerged. You know, it, it is fascinating if we count the number of think tanks that have, that have evolved and the type of policy discussions and the papers that they're producing. We see, you know, the movements, the flag movements, uh, these types of movements, uh, which really transformed the narratives of political debates, forced policymakers to introduce new social safety nets uh, in that context uh, um, to have them respond. We've seen, you know, not only that um, political protests coming from, you know, the black flag movement that have, that are, um, the government have tried to respond to, but they had nothing to do with political party leaders, you know, in the sense that they are different groups of leaders uh, from the young, uh, spontaneous in terms of the conditions. Um, and you can see, you know, the the kind of the new groups um, uh, that have been around, but many of them led by young in areas of, for example, like the environment uh, and, and that discussions about climate change and others, uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of the nexus between the private sector and um, and particular kind of different social policies, social policies in terms of social corporate responsibility. Uh, there are whole sets of initiatives, and they're just not around, not only around COVID. And so, in some ways, the private sector, civil society, uh, are shaping the narratives. The politicians are focusing on where's my position, where's my car, where's my, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, how am I going to get elected? Who am I going to have to take into my political party? You know, and the, and even while some some of the debates in Parliament are, I think, the caliber has improved generally uh, overall, and there's more discussions of policy. I think COVID has pushed that, uh, but a lot of these things are, are also being set by statements coming from organizations, and they're not just in KL; they're everywhere in Malaysia. Right? And, and you know, I, I, do I want to use the word optimism? Uh, I think I would carefully, I would use be a bit more cautious, keen to use the word optimism. I mean, I see the problems just as much as everyone else in this context. But what I also highlight is that there are positives. And what, what I think that a lot of people just are just gloom and doom, Malaysia's over, everything's, you know, it's the end of Malaysia. But but I think it, it, in order to see things holistically, you have to see what's the positives with the things that are the negatives and how they're reshaping. Uh, you know, I, I think the challenge for me is that, uh, is that uh, you know, the political parties and the part, political leadership do not have the holistic vision to understand the broader type of changes and how to to group with that but the fact is is that you know with democratization inevitably there are going to be new forces that emerge in, in in the way that power is is centered in Malaysia and this is not necessarily a bad thing especially given the fact that you know you know if we think about the narratives of civil society now you know they're no longer just exclusively the percasas the the kind of the the Ketuana Malayu racist discourse that the media focuses on there's a plurality of issues that are talked about in, in, in more substantive ways. Is there room for more substance? substance? Yes. But it, the, at the same juncture, uh, what we do see is a very thoughtful and meaningful discussions across ethnic communities as well. And Masna, um, oh, would, yeah. would you like to speak? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think, I think uh, what's happening now, uh, what is I said, the other side of the glass, is it the, the half filled glass, is that it's very difficult to uh, enumerate, you know, it's not as easy as it was when we're able to count votes, parties, political parties, who's in charge. 
and who's uh, uh, you know who's behind and who are the followers. I think there's a lot of uh, the, the sense of disruption now is so magnified in a way. And, and so it makes it very difficult for us to say, yes, you see all these different multiple groups are actually going to contribute to change. Yeah? But the fact of the matter is that they're there. You see, they're there. And, then, and so we cannot deny that all these different uh, groups and groupings and uh, uh, points, you see, are sites of mobilization, as, as I would say. Uh, some may not even call themselves uh, political, yet, you see, in a very small way, they do contribute to uh, change. Uh, so just because we cannot study them easily, it doesn't mean that we should dismiss them. I think we still need to find a way see, to, to kind of uh, evaluate, you see, what would be the sum you see, of the contribution towards this democratic innovation. Uh, so it is, a, it is an innovation, whether it succeeds or not, you see, that's, what, that's maybe uh, something for us to see only in the future. So, so again, you know, we always come back to the same paradigm. We look at the electoral results. Uh, as though, you see, that's a BN and end all, you see, of uh, Malaysia's uh, future. And then we see if BN is defeated, we think that, okay, there's reform. Obviously, you see, that didn't happen. There was no reform. In fact, it was so weak that even it allowed itself you see, to be taken over by the other side. So, so uh, but, but people are learning uh, each step of the way. And I, I think the sense of its disruption is the one, you see, that's causing the innovation. Um, but we have to wait a, a little bit longer to see the outcome. Just a tad, I just wanted to say that the need, you know, I want to echo what Mazda was saying about the need for new analytical tools and framing of understanding Malaysian politics. That, you know, in particular, I, I, my research tries to emphasize looking at people, looking at how they are thinking and engaging, not just looking at political parties and not just necessarily in elections. You know, politics is, is completely beyond elections in the context of Malaysian uh, right now. Uh, and I think that, the, that this, this looking at their different paradigms, mobilization, social movements, other things that we can begin to start to think about. Mm. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, that, that sort of partly takes <laughs> what I was going to ask you. But I think that that's great because it really actually also touches on something that all of you have also um, raised, which is actually the rather dramatic changing of demographics. And certainly in terms of electoral terms, uh, with this Undi 18 uh, automatic registration, a huge influx of um, vote, new voters, uh, but also how a lot of their understanding of politics has not been determined by the traditional mainstream media or even the political parties that now exist. And whether there's a bit of a scramble for that, where I think as recently as say a month ago, one of our uh, friends um, in UMNO middle management were worried about whether the tail is now going to wag the dog. Uh, if that's a pseudo metaphor, actually, not quite halal. I'm um, sorry, but uh, you know the the question of you know these demographics being uh, proving uh, unpredictable. I, I wondered whether um, James, you might want to touch on that uh, ahead of these um, what appear to be consequential state elections. Oh, thank you, Kim. So my take is that while it is true that the young people uh, uh, coming in to vote uh, will lead to a profound change in the way we understand uh, elections in Malaysia, um, I take a much uh, darker view of democratization. It is my, my contention that uh, we are not likely to see democratization in Malaysia. And that uh, it depends, everything will be dependent on G15 results. If, for example, the Malay community returns either Bersatu or Amno, and one of them become a dominant party again, I think you will see a, a, a total regression. I think one of the things that came out very clearly after the Sheraton move was that uh, the Malay community uh, felt the need to demand uh, Malay dominance again. You have to remember, uh, in, in the two years before the fall of the Pakistan Harapan government, uh, who would have thought that Amno and PAS would get, get back together? A former electoral pair under Mwafaka. And the reason is because they spread this fear about the Malays being marginalized. I think the big lesson that came out of 2020 was that the Malays realized that even if you hold complete power in the government, it doesn't mean you're united. There are also some things happening in the background. 
And this is where I come back to the earlier point that, uh, you know, since the fall of, of Pakistan, uh, basically the Malay elites are searching for a new model. They're looking for political stability under Malay dominance. So that's the reason why so much emphasis is paid uh, on making sure that, you know, GE15 returns, uh, for lack of a better word, the right results, that it is very clear who the Malay community was thought to be the dominant Malay voice. The only question mark is what about the younger Malays? Uh, it is my take that the younger Malays is not as political sophisticated as a lot of people think. Uh, part of the reason is because they've been socialized under the current system. Uh, what I do see is that there's an increasing role among the younger Malays. Uh, they are building up space for a thing called, or what I call political Islam, that uh, Islamic or a brand of Islamic politics will take center stage among the young people. Uh, yes, it is true that they will be less racial, but at the same time, they'll be more Islamic. Uh, I'm not about the religion itself, I'm talking about the way uh, uh, they use religion to articulate their political interests. I see that coming, uh, coming in, in a big way among, among the younger people. So basically, my take is that everything hinge on GE15, and if we don't get a clear result in GE15, uh, it will lead to more political instability. Uh, so that's the reason why you know people invest so much in the Malacca elections because they think uh, that the results of the election will signal which way uh, you know the wind for the uh, which way the wind is blowing, especially for Malay votes. However, um, the Sarawak state elections though would give us a somewhat different signal, wouldn't it? Uh, given the no, you have conditions. to remember. I've always made the argument that. Sabah and Sarawak are not part of the normal Malaysian political system. <laughs> they're sort of out there, they're sort of out there on their own. This is especially true of Sarawak. I mean, Sarawak basically what the GPS government is trying to do is they try to create a ring fence around the whole of Sarawak. So the game they play is quite interesting. Uh, the only game in town for GPS is Sarawak state nationalism. Uh, they made it very clear, Sarawak for Sarawakians, Sarawakians first. So what is interesting about, about this model they're looking at is that they're bringing a ring fence around Sarawak and they want to win maximum number of parliamentary seats so they can use their, their what do you call it, uh, their group as a bargaining chip against the federal government. So that's the reason why you see, right, they never want to join the federal government. What they want is an ally. So right now, for example, because they're ally of both the Perikatan and the Kamen Ispan Sabri government, right? You can see they have an outlandish uh, space to the federal government in terms of number of ministers, the number of political appointees, the number of resources given to them. Uh, you look at the world's ministers, for the last three world's ministers, they've all been from Sabah and Sarawak. And they're pouring billions of dollars into the Fan Borneo Highway, throwing a lot of money into Sabah and Sarawak. And basically, despite throwing all this money, right? Do you see people in Sabah, um, I mean, do you see the political class in Sabah and Sarawak saying good things about the Malayan political class? The answer is no. In fact, the reverse has happened. There's a stronger feeling of Sarawak for Sarawakians, stronger feeling of Sabah for Sabahans. And in fact, they, they're asking for more. They're asking for constitutional amendments. So this is a very strange phenomenon where uh, I would argue that Malaysian politics heading forward is, is like a fork road, right? On the one hand, the Malayan political establishment is going was on the left hand side, they're going towards a search for, uh, for political stability. In Sabah and Sarawak, they're searching for a new political model, how they can be autonomous and yet extract maximum uh, uh, funds from the federal government. So these two things that happen concurrently. So I think it is it's a big mistake to try to try to understand political politics and try to fit Sabah and Sarawak into the picture. It's, it's better to say that there are essentially two pictures happening at the same time. But there's a group of people who can move within these two pictures. Which, which I think seems to speak also to what Bridget had raised about the um, persistent polarization, especially in Borneo, that you worry about. But I, I suppose that would actually reflect as well um, in terms of questioning what the legitimacy of the Malayan parties too, politically. No, the, the point I'm trying to make is that. Uh, it is seen as polarization by outsiders, but inside in Sabah and Sarawak itself, it's not seen as, as, mm. as uh, polarization. What the people of Sabah and Sarawak feel is that, you know, after a more than half a century, for lack of a better word, being screwed by Kuala Lumpur and Putrajaya, 
this is our time because the Malay establishment in Kuala Lumpur is split now. This is the time where we can get our maximum benefits, switching constitution amendments, getting uh, more money, getting more funding, asking for decentralization. So what is interesting is that uh, to me, right, the political class in Sabah and Sarawak, yes, they have differences in terms of which party they belong to, uh, all that sort of stuff. But when it comes to the issue of trying to uh, exercise some sort of leverage against Putrajaya, I can guarantee you they're all united on this issue. Um, can I interject here, Kian, if you don't mind? Sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I think, I, think I, I see some contradictions in your argument, uh, James, because on the one hand, you say that uh, Malay dominance is here to stay. And on the other hand, you say that there's this uh, polarization and very much uh, is a uh, resentment is it coming from the East Malaysian states? So I, I don't think the two can go, and that is the reason why. In fact, the argument but, but when you made about Sabah and Sarawak asserting you know themselves uh, would be the very reason uh, to lead to Amno, you see, or any Malay party's failure to dominate. I think, and and I and I still go by that uh, four electoral arenas kind of theory where. Uh, Amno simply was able to dominate before because he had a very good you see, vehicle to support its dominance, and that was the BN. It doesn't have that vehicle anymore, and and you know teaming up with another Malay party will not help. The more they team up with uh, another Malay party like PAS, the more you see there will be a rejection you see from the other electoral arenas, particularly Sabah yeah. and Sarawak. So sure. I I feel that this is the situation that we are faced with. If you say that, uh, I, I, I really feel that it is a turning point. And this is a turning point. And I don't think we should cling on, you see, to an argument, you see, that the Malay parties are going to go all out, uh, come what may, you see, they're going to try to, to, to dominate. I don't think it's possible at all. And I no, beg you from the Malacca yeah. election, it's going to show that that's precisely what's going to happen. I, I, I think you misunderstood what I said. What I said was that in G15, if the Malay electorate returns a clear signal that one of the parties is dominant, then we're moving back to the Barisan National Authoritarian ways. But if they don't return a clear signal, as in the Malay vote is still split, we are heading towards more instability. That's what I said. Well, it doesn't I, matter. I, all the Malays can vote for Amno and, and pass, but they're not going to win all the seats. See, that's the point. And in any case, I do not agree with you that the Malay electorates are homogenous or monolithic. Uh, uh, no, regardless I said, I said, of the, I don't, no, I, I, of the, I of the I demographics, I, was, I, I don't think they are. They've never been in any case before. No, what I said was that whether one of the two core Malay party, Bersatu, Amno, will return, you know, in terms of numbers, whether one of them will be dominant in GE15. That's what I said. Can I interject here? Uh, can I, I would like to sort of add just a, a couple of points here. I also differ from James in that I don't think GE15 is going to be the be end, end all of the, where the trajectories are. Um, I don't know whether or not, you know, we will see this in terms of what happens in the Malacca and Sarawak, but my sense is that elections are an indication of the complexities, not necessarily at end as a resolution of that. But I do agree with James in that I think that um, we are going to see a, a persistence and, and even perhaps a deepening of, uh, of what I would call conservative right, um, uh, right uh, ethno-nationalist narratives uh, from the perspective of, uh, now this doesn't mean Mazda that everyone agrees with them. I, dis I, dis I think that it's clearly there's tremendous diversity in the Malay community, but the, in terms of being a narrative, we can see this already as because uh, in, the, in Ismail Sabri's government, because they have no other forms of legitimacy because of the weak governance of themselves, they turn to that. But also the things that are happening in the society itself, we have, because of this lack of social mobility, the economic insecurity, these narratives find easy um, uh, acceptance uh, and they're deeply part of the socialization process. You know, the problems of the way the education system has operated, the problems associated in terms of uh, the way that there is lack of kind of inter interconnectivity among different ethnic groups compared to the past. These problems are still very deep in the society and they're not being addressed through policy solutions. And the politicians use these narratives. And I expect the backlash to be stronger 
um, uh, to the kind of the more open and liberal forces uh, as things move forward because the parties are so weak. So I, in this context, I, I do worry about uh, what that what that means for the the fabric of society because uh, at least you know people are there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of resentments, and people feel that very uh, emotionally um, in when these things come up in the political space. Would you say, actually, that's interesting, um, Bridget, when you touch on the anger and resentment, I mean, it's so apparent in terms of the economic devastation that the pandemic has created and the mass unemployment, somewhat underreported, really, that is uh, out there and the decimation of the so-called middle class, um, that th this is exactly the problem that you don't have any sort of legitimate uh, political expression of that or parties to lead that, that this is what gives rise to the instability or turmoil that James alludes to? I think this is important for us to think about. I think we that we still need more research to understand these complexities. But you know, if you look at the budget, last budget uh, of this year, it's a budget that is a disappointment. It's the highest spending budget ever in Malaysia history. So you would expect it to be a bonanza, and everyone would be happy with it. But the, across the board, everybody's unhappy with it because there's not enough. Uh, it, it's it's risky in terms of the way the spending is going on, and then it begins to change the tax revenue equation in a way that is going to uh, actually, I think negatively, it has already negatively impacted not only the stock market, but also in terms of foreign investment of where, you know, this uh, Ismail Sabri's government and Muhyiddin's government, I believe, has been a very xenophobic government, which I think has had, and it had implication from a perspective of, uh, of uh, declining foreign investment, which Malaysia needs because that's job creation, uh, especially in some key parts of the Malay heartland uh, among, among other areas. But what we, but what I see is when we think about about um, the, the drivers of this, we need to think about it complex in a very complex different framing. You know, we have to look at the education system. We have to look at the economic dynamics, which I agree are completely, um, uh, uh, I think, uh, underreported because the, they want to continue to use the numbers in a particular way of legitimation. So there's no real discussion of what those numbers mean. So when growth numbers are positive, those don't necessarily mean that most people in Malaysia are feeling that growth. It's quite the, quite the opposite. <laughs> especially when the growth comes from sectors like palm oil or even the rise in the oil prices or some of the key uh, sectors in electronics, which doesn't, which are now going through automation, which change the job dynamics and many which employ foreign labor. So in this context, I think we need to unpack this as scholars to understand these kind of dynamics that are happening from below and to look at the economy. And I think one of the problems is people talk only about the political dynamics and not recognizing that this is also, this these, these political forces are driven by, by, by the economy as well. To keep in mind that, you know, when the Sheraton move happened, a lot of that were was supported by cronies who were happy that it was back to business in this particular way. And the corruption and the cronyism that has existed during the COVID crisis, which I, will, I believe ultimately will have the lens of light uh, would be a very is a very troubling dynamic in the last two years and that's exactly the problem isn't it i suppose because the economic model we've known for a while now at least for the past decade is really quite broken and the the reset was supposed to happen with 2018 and you know to re, uh, address the corruption problem not to mention the reshaping of an economy for whether it's a service sector or to move away from a reliance on oil and gas and commodities. And now that the SME sector appears to be in pretty bad shape, it alludes to what you were mentioning too, wasn't it, James, that uh, this, this is the sort of post-pandemic reality or grim sort of nightmare that everyone is having to now deal with without political credibility? I, I think one of the problems we have in Malaysia is that we think that uh, the economic issue have a major impact on politics. It's always been my argument that it's actually the political plays that informs the economy in Malaysia, the economy in Malaysia. The reason I say that is because the bulk of the Malaysian economy is actually owned by the GLCs. I mean, I mean that's just the reality. If the government moves in one direction, the whole economy moves in that direction because, you know, it's a GLC that moves the economy. That's the reason why the, well, you know, the GLCs control the Malaysian stock market. They've done it for years. Everybody knows this. 
So really, uh, uh, while it is two SMEs are mostly in Chinese hands, they're just a very small part of the Malaysian economy. Uh, it is the GLCs. We talk about reforms on the Malaysian economy, right? It's not in 2018. Everybody knows that um, Malaysian reforms economy, basically you're talking about reforming the uh, Bumutra uh, agenda or the new economic policy. It goes back all the way back to 1991. And there was the first attempt met to, to reject the Malaysian economy. So as long as you do not, as long as you, you have an a institutionalized rain-seeking component of the economy uh, still working, it's very difficult to, to uh, reform the economy. So for example, uh, uh, when, when Najib came in, came in right, he set up a new economic uh, model, he tried very hard to push it through, he couldn't do it because the, the Malay establishment uh, you know, were not willing to give up their, their rank city behavior. So I, I think, I think it's, it's important to, to, to reiterate that the Malaysian economy is very much a political play. Uh, you can talk to any stockbroker in Malaysia, they will tell you that at certain times of the year, certain counters suddenly move. Why? Because the individual who has linked to that counter suddenly is about to get a big project from the government, you know, all these sort, sort of issues. So I think the economy, yes, while it plays a role in the day of lives of individuals, I think collectively uh, it is the political class that informs the economy rather than the other way around. But I need to go back to my point. I think it's, it's, it's I think a lot of people misunderstood what I was saying about the search for political stability. When I talk about the search for political stability, I'm talking about the mindset of the Malay establishment. The mindset of the Malay establishment is that. Uh, Barisan National, despite the fact that most scholars say it's terrible, right? They say it's actually a very good system because it provided stability. Yeah? I'm not here to argue whether it's good or bad. I'm just saying that the mindset of the Malay establishment is that they say the Barisan National was a good system because it provided stability for many, many years. Now, what is the core of the Barisan National system? The core of the Barisan National system is basically the one dominant Malay party and you can have countless other parties that join them. But the dominant Malay party is first among equals. So that is what I'm talking about when I talk about the search for political stability after GE15. Whether the Malay community will support one party with a large number of seats, whether it's Bersatu or, or, or Amno, that this party will become the dominant party, whatever coalition, it may be called Barisan National, it may be called whatever it is, I don't care. But they are looking for this sort of setup again. So that's what I mean when I say that people are looking towards GE15 to get a clear signal from the Malay electorate whether you have one dominant party because they didn't get it in 2018. It is quite clear that the Malay electorate in 2018, doesn't matter how you look at the statistics, will basically uh, you know, divide up, the vote will divide up three ways between Bersatu, Amno, and Pass. And because of that, you lead to a lot of instability. 2020, it fell apart, the model fell apart because Pass and Amno got together against Bersatu. So now people are going back to the books and saying, how do we search for a new stability? Whether it's good or bad, it doesn't matter. My point is that, you know, they truly believe that you need one dominant Malay party and all the other parties can join that dominant Malay party. Um well, going back to that, I mean, I suppose, you know, Masna, you were, you know, referring to all these recent books uh, that have come out, rather than Paradise Lost, this could be the paradise to be found again, right? That uh, we, we have to somehow, what, find that Malay stability, but is that like, you know, using the um, somewhat fashionable 3R model that people keep citing, where maybe also the stability comes from referring to the inviolable uh, royalty as well. Is, is there something in there with um, a stability uh, search that can happen there? Uh, I'm not sure about when you say stability, I think I go back to Bridget's point. It's really people are just suffering now. And I, I'm not sure whether when you're in that state, you, know, you think about political stability, you're really just thinking about you know, how to put food on the table. Uh, I would expect that's the major, I think, challenge, you know, facing any political parties uh, at this point. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just imagining, you see, people will be probably be looking for a messiah now. Okay, who's going to be able to promise, you see, this uh, return to paradise, quote unquote, right? Uh, and, and return to paradise really uh, in terms of economic stability, see, rather than political stability. 
of course, the, the two goes uh, together. So I think young people, particularly, mm, definitely they're going to they're uh, uh, reject the old model. Now, whether is it that rejection translates into an electoral outcome, that's a different story because the outcome, as you all say, is a distillation of all these complexities and diversities you know, of the electoral uh, population itself, right? But uh, for sure, see, at least in the diverse peninsula, I mean, we were to use still, see, that, that kind of uh, division, diverse peninsula, um, we're very sure, right? I think James also made this point that the Chinese party, that the Chinese electorate will not, of course, you see, vote for uh, what do you call the election, uh, the, the, the coalition, the PN. Uh, although, although there's a bit of a, it's a question mark, right? Whether it's still called the PN now. Um, they're not going to vote for them, right? The young people, most of the young people, uh, are probably based in diverse peninsula, you know, uh, electoral uh, uh, districts, and they're not going to vote for them either. But structurally, of course, it doesn't, it will not translate, is it, into the rejection of the PN because we have also the Malay uh, electorate, see, the Northeastern, and, and, and we don't know how uh, Sabah and Sarawak see, will vote, or they will vote, but they will then uh, make decision after the election, the post election kind of alliance, right? So yeah, I, I, I think this, this idea about uh, searching for political stability, I don't think is very high on people's mind now, although I might be wrong. Uh, it is really just a very practical need you see, to survive and to prosper uh, at this time. And whether mm -hmm. you know, people uh, connect that to a dominant stable party, I am really not sure about that. Uh, if, if, you, if you remember, I, I never said about the people, I said the Malay mm -hmm. establishment, the elite. Oh, okay, good that you said that. Uh, even the Malay establishment is split. It's split. Uh, Ken, do you say royalty? I'm not sure what role they are playing now. I doubt they can. I, I, don't, I, just, I, don't, I, I don't just see, thinking, you know, they make a lot of noise, right? Okay, it's dramatic, some of the interjections, but I don't think it counts for anything. I just thought, you know, yeah. when you're talking about the search for stability and legitimacy, uh -huh. the royals play that role of, you know, a past and, you know, a backstory. Uh, Bridget, I think it'd be good uh, to get your view as well about, you know, that um, instability, I suppose, that we're talking about now, how uh, this decimation of jobs and uh, the economy and the sort of anger that comes from that and the uh, uncertainties. Because um, were you referring partly uh, to the, uh, thinking of that when you were talking about this persistent polarization? Well, I think that uh, when you have economic insecurity, uh, what people turn to different forces, right? You know, you know, we have to understand that, you know, Malaysia has been a country that's benefited from globalization. Now there's deglobalization. There's now a dynamic where um, you've had uh, tremendous government interventions and patronage systems, and they've completely eroded at the grassroots levels. You have inadequate social safety nets, and then you have an economic crisis, uh, arguably the most serious economic crisis the, ever, the country has ever had. Uh, had. Uh, and many of the solutions have just been short term, not thinking about the uh, kind of the, the way to transform Malaysia's economy. There's this, there's this myth that you know, things are going to get back, things will open up and with vaccinations at the high level, that everything's going to go back to normal. And we know that finance, that crises uh, deepen existing inequalities, and they also leave a, 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 a tremendous uh, mark on the society. And we can see this uh, uh, in small things like your favorite rest, banana leaf restaurant closing, or your or the big things are, are or smaller things, you know, um, uh, uh, people begging on the streets, higher homelessness. These are uh, these are very things that are evident in Malaysia compared to the past, and it, it involves a, a complex rethinking about the relationships uh, and, and the policy agendas, which the, the political leaders are still very they're navel gazing at uh, among themselves uh, at political power, um, as opposed to looking at the, the bigger policy challenges that the country are facing, but. Parts of civil society and think tanks or others are contributing to some of those discourses, but not, but it is not reaching that. Now, when I think about stability, you know, in the context of Malaysia, it is about institution building. It is about strengthening the institutions that are going to, to, to be, that are outside of the, uh, the, the politics of the situation in terms of political parties. You know, everyone, one of the, the dynamics of a decay of AMNO has been that this, that there is a severing or there's a, there's a 
uh, not necessarily severing, but a, a distancing of the political party from the establishment. Uh, and so you do see, for example, tensions within the civil service uh, in terms of some of the dynamics. And unfortunately, the civil service is also suffering from corruption and from the systemic problems that have been around for a long time. But, but how we, these institutions need strengthening from the perspective of their roles and not necessarily the nexus, right? One of the challenges for the royalty right now is that the next that it has become highly politicized as part of the dynamics of, of politics. It's lost its role as a, a from a more, more distancing role. Uh, the, and this and one of the on the opposite side, the civil society, the civil ser service is also trying to kind of come up and to respond to circumstances. So I think you know policies that strengthen institutions that are going to uh, and that means it's going to be hard decisions. There needs to be civil service reform. They need to cut back the civil service because there's too many people in it. And there's too much expenditure. You have to increase the the, the composition, it, 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 the caliber. There's some great civil servants. They need to be able to have the space to be able to operate and do their job. Now these things are are, too, are difficult choices, but but we can see the the disruptions, as Master puts it, the corrupt the crisis, as I would uh, describe it, are forcing these changes in different ways now in Malaysia. Um, and I think that is why we see these co these contradictory sets of trends of where politics is. Is is everywhere because all of these things are coming to a, coming to different different heads in terms of decisions that have to be made, and they're not being made, and that's what makes people frustrated. That's that's really good point. I, I guess it's really about you know institutional failures and the need to fix it, especially with exacerbated inequality you know, as as shown up by a uh, pandemic, um, and of course it leaves space open, I suppose for demagoguery to thrive as has happened uh, historically over the past previous bloody century. Um, I, I was just curious uh, in the few minutes we have left, whether we could peer ahead into the near future of what um, types of possible, you know, structural uh, improvements that might happen. The demographic undi 18, I don't know, big wave that is supposed to come in aside, uh, what, what, what else could we also consider? Um, would you like to start, Mazna, maybe James uh, or Bridget, and we could probably wind up? Yeah, uh, yeah. thanks, Ken. The UNDI 18, I think, yes, of course, if you look at it from the point of view of demographics, uh, it's a good idea, but demographic in itself does not translate again you see, to electoral outcome. So it depends on who the young people are. And I have a feeling that they are basically concentrated in the urban uh, sites. So you can have a lot of people, young people uh, voting in a very informed way. But again, you see, it will not affect the outcome from the other uh, electoral sites. Uh, so yeah, I think we, we need a strategy. Uh, it's a good thing just to have it there. It's, it doesn't mean that you know it will mean change. I think also for political parties, uh, DAP, of course, uh, I'm sure has is thinking along the lines of how are they going to fit into this uh, diverse you know picture. Uh, most importantly, I think PKR. Uh, yeah, we haven't really talked about political parties. So here, I think again, you know, I'm just. Uh, I'm just being a pundit here, see. PKR seems to be in a good position structurally. I'm not even talking about Anwar. Structurally, see, they seem to be able to seize the moment, yeah, because they have to ride this wave, you see, of diversity. Um, and Amno and Bersatu, as James has put it, they're going to fight tooth and nail. And I think both are going to suffer out of it. And my final point is on the present Prime Minister, although I don't know anything about him, right, but he seems to be mildly... Uh, providing a stabilizing force now uh, because uh, simply because of the concessions that he's making and he's not kind of uh, over uh, uh, what the, the, the ret rhetoric is it that he's he's not really into that kind of uh, uh, game is it that I'm not used to play before um, so yeah so maybe in short okay let me let me just uh, stick my neck out and say I'm not as gloomy. You know, uh, uh, my, my impression of Malaysia is that it's not going to be that gloomy see, in the future. Uh, and I mm. think that this disruption is creating quite a lot of creative uh, chaos as far as I'm concerned. Bridget? Thanks. Let's go with James first. Okay, James. 
You're wrong. Oh, I'm, I'm Dr. Yes. Gloom. <laughs> you're, you're, we, we, well, it's we'll, a balance, we'll, we'll you do, see. We'll with, do with Dr. Gloom. Okay, we'll do Dr. Gloom. So, so basically, the, 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 the way I would argue about what's going to happen, over, I'm, I'm talking about over the next six months, uh, I don't think anybody can predict two years down the road or whatever. So basically, I, I see two things happening. I see Ismail Sabri try to global and make sure his, his government survives. He's going to try very best to put together a system to kill off the Satu with GE15. Uh, I think the opposition will come out very badly because they signed an MOU giving him the breathing space and people will come back to remind the opposition. That's on the Malaya side. Uh, where I see the sunshine is in Sabah and Sarawak. I think in Sabah and Sarawak, I think you will see a more rise of state nationalism in both Sabah and Sarawak. And certainly the people in Sabah and Sarawak feel emboldened because they see all this huru-hara in, in Peninsular Malaysia. And they think this is the best time for us to uh, assert maximum political pressure to get maximum concessions. Uh, a lot of this will be tied in with the performance of GPS in terms of the constitution amendment. As you know, the law minister in Malaysia now is the guy from Sarawak. And they also have appointed a special minister in charge of Sabah and Sarawak affairs. So they have to deliver on the amendments. If they don't deliver on the amendments, then both the state government or the incumbent governments in Sabah and Sarawak will lose a level of political legitimacy. But that doesn't take away from the earlier point I said, among the ordinary people, you will see a rise of state nationalism. That's all for me. Thanks. And Bridget, you have the last word. Uh, well, I think we have to look to the past and to the future. I think that um, uh, uh, if the election commission does continues to hold off on putting young people into vote, uh, that you should expect people on the streets. Number one. <laughs> Number two, I think that um, if we look at the uh, impact of Sabah and Sarawak, I slightly differ in terms of James. And well, I agree that there's empowerment, but I also worry that this is going to have a counter reaction from the federal government. And this, and in turn, will potentially add to more contention. Uh, and it's worrying because the tensions are and the, the, the changes and different outlooks are very are misunderstood and are growing in terms of that parameters. But in as but where I I see the a really most interesting dynamic is in a new generation of leaders. You know, the youth is, is big, right? You know, there's a conservative and liberal and uh, different dynamics. Many of them are disengaged from politics. But what's interesting are the youth leaders, what I call the youth vanguard. And, I and we do see new types of discussions coming from younger generations. They're taking ownership of the political arena. And the political parties may put some young candidates, but they're not changing their leadership. And that's where I see the big changes that are going to happen. And whether or not it's a demagogue or a Democrat uh, will be the interesting thing to watch. Um, I'm hoping that it's the latter. Thank you, Bridget. That was a good um, uncertain level we could finish on. Uh, and, and it's great. So the East rises and the youth might save us all yet again. Um, Thanks everybody for participating and the questions that we received. Hopefully we managed to cover many of those points. Um, uh, and uh, thanks, um, Bridget, Masna, James, for um, another enlightening discussion about where Malaysia goes next. Um, we will uh, continue uh, the next sessions uh, after a short break. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. All right. Thank you. I'm stop.